is um, Colombo and um, Mel is the president, and I hope he's here today. So I hope you have all your questions and learn something about cybersecurity today because working from home and schooling from home, cybersecurity has increased a lot. So hopefully we can take something away from this session today. So enjoy, sip on your wine. Okay, uh, thank you, Patricia. Uh, quick question, can you hear me well? Because there was an issue of the of some audio. I may go ahead and just mute everyone just to confirm that we don't get too many echoes. Uh, if you would like to uh, speak, uh, please let me know and I'll activate your uh, your mic uh, and and I'll pose occasionally and, and see if you guys have any questions or need any clarifications. Okay, so good evening. Uh, it's uh, Thursday, April 23rd, 2020. Uh, we are all under COVID-19 uh, house arrest. And uh, well, most of us in kind of house arrest, right? Um, to some degree. Uh, and uh, the idea of uh, this presentation, so as Patricia mentioned, this uh, presentation was requested by the Graduate Students Association. Uh, and I'm more than happy to uh, assist. Uh, the idea of the presentation is basically to talk a little bit about the research uh, that I've, that my group has been doing and is doing, uh, and also to talk about some professional associations. So the focus of the talk is uh, more on the research side of what I've, what I've been doing and what my doctoral students under my supervision been doing and I'll talk about briefly. I'm recording the session and I will be sharing the link as needed. So um, um, I'm not sure I need any introduction. Most of you, if not all of you already know me from uh, the college, right? Uh, I'll talk about what uh, we will do today. The agenda is basically to review um, a brief overview of the different types of research, just two large buckets um, that I'll try to uh, explain when we talk about human factor in uh, IS and cybersecurity. Uh, there are some um, research theories and, and uh, borrowing that is conducted. So there is a, there are sharing done between IS, information systems and the cybersecurity uh, arena. So I would, um, when I talk, I'll talk about both, but the focus of my work in, in the last decade or so is on cybersecurity. So you're going to see uh, me diving deeper into it. Um, I'll talk about the challenges specifically. We've discussed this in, in my risk management class in the PhD program, and I'll reiterate the issue uh, today. Uh, just to clarify some of the challenges and the difficulties we have and also validity regarding uh, research that is being done on the human factor specifically in IS uh, and, and cybersecurity in particular. Um, I'll talk about the complexity and robustness of some measures that are being used. And so uh, I'll, I'll discuss how difficult it can be to really do a robust research study. And then I'll dive into a theoretical foundation for the research, the main theoretical foundation for some of the studies, not all, but some of the studies uh, that we conduct in my uh, SciLab under my supervision. We'll talk about uh, some ongoing, I'll give you a brief overview of a couple of the research studies. Some of those doctoral students are right now in uh, participating in here, attending the session, and I'll conclude the session talking about professional associations. Uh, what what do we get out of them? What type of associations you should join? Um, some benefits that you can get out of it, and how to join, and what what are the what I call the ROI, return on investment, on some of those associations. So let's talk uh, talk about the human factor. Uh, specifically in IS and cybersecurity, but more uh, precisely in cybersecurity. The, um, the two 
larger buckets that I'll put the research in our field into is one that is done basically just on theoretical. This is more on trying to um, uh, develop some measures of constructs to see some relationships of constructs. Primarily, um, these are being done to collect data and analyze the data that will later on will allow us to do some sort of a theoretical modeling and say, okay, here is a model that was applied in, let's say, the medical field or uh, in the, uh, you know, if we talk about um, risk mitigation uh, in, uh, I don't know, the space program in NASA, right? How do we reduce uh, risk? And so we'll talk about some overarching theory over there and let's take that from that particular field and try to apply it into cybersecurity. And now we're gonna tweak the constructs and tweak the measures and we're gonna see if the theory holds true in this context. Okay, so these are primarily theoretical type of research and they will conduct you know, whatever the research, collect the data and analyze it. Then there are those what we call applied research and applied research is more uh, closer to what we call the engineering type of research. There is a very clear, emphasized uh, problem, research problem that we're trying to uh, address. Uh, usually those type of research studies will tend to be developmental or experimental studies. Uh, we tend to develop things that can be an application or a tool or some sort of a, um, uh, an artifact that we will take that particular uh, artifact or a thing, if you will, and then measure how good that helps us in mitigating the type of the um, problem that we're trying to address, right? That, uh, that's, so if we look into the two higher level type of research studies, I can, you know, very simplify it into those two higher level buckets. Well, um, this is where the challenge comes in because some of the theoretical research in the context of uh, specifically human factor in IS and cybersecurity uh, had some uh, issues with their measures, right? Because to actually measure certain things, especially behavior, and I'll talk about it in a moment, when it comes to um, cybersecurity research, it's very difficult, right? And so to collect data on how individuals really perform on when it comes to cybersecurity, it, it is a challenge. How they perform in organization, how they're gonna perform in, at home now that they're working. Um, and, and so what exactly are their decisions? Uh, how exactly they make those decisions? What type of uh, fun, foundational, uh, what do we call KSAs, knowledge, skills, and abilities do they have in order to make those decisions? These are crucial, but they're very difficult to measure. So take, for example, and I'll talk about that as well, because we've conducted a couple of studies on that. Take, for example, the issue of skills. How do you measure skills? That's very difficult right? You want to measure a skill, you need to develop some, something. And the skill is not something you can ask people to write on a survey, right? This is, this is invalid. Um, it's like me asking you how well your, your, you or your child uh, is skilled when it comes to swimming, right? So you're going to answer me in a, in a multiple choice uh, survey that's invalid, right? Uh, the only valid way for me to test your swimming skills is to throw you into a water and say swim swim and see if you swim or you sink right uh and and that will demonstrate that you actually uh have the the skill but i will i may ask you also some questions to see if you even have a knowledge before i throw you into the water so there is no disaster right so i may do a, a knowledge test first and if you pass the knowledge test then i'll throw you into the water and ask you to perform right? Uh, we have the same challenge in cybersecurity because we can't really ask people to answer on a multiple choice or uh, uh, Likert scale type uh, uh, surveys. 
And that leads me to re really the, the issue of research validity, because uh, a lot of research that has been conducted, both in the IS field and the cybersecurity field, is lately, specifically when they move to information security and cybersecurity, some of those measures become completely obsolete. And I'll give you some examples. We've discussed that in the context of um, some of my classes, my doctoral classes. And I wanna uh, bring that in. And so, some of the students who were in that class will recognize the discussion because we had some heated uh, debate on the issue. So I wanna open it up and reiterate this to the whole class. So here is uh, the issue of, uh, so a lot of studies in IS specifically on the theoretical side has been doing work on uh, theory of reasoned action, theory of plant behavior, a technology acceptance model, and all the variations that were following on those in the 90s and the early, early 2000s, including some of my studies. Okay, I was, I'm guilty as well. <laughs> um, but uh, because that was the fashion at that time, right? Um, not in the context of cybersecurity, all of it, but uh, in IS. And, and so that's where about 15 years ago or so, there was a, a heated debate uh, and discussion. I attended uh, AIMSIS in uh, San Diego, um, and uh, there was a massive debate on the whole aspect of, of um, What's the validity of all these theories in the context of, of information systems, the context of, of uh, information security in particular? Some of these uh, studies were trying to measure behavior, but they had difficulties to measure actual behavior. So they asked individuals to either reflect and say what their behavior is. Okay, how valid is that? We'll talk in a moment. Or they were trying to ask people to get to the point where they just explain their intentions to behave. Why? Because there were a couple of studies in the 90s that some of them, not all of them, that showed a strong uh, impact between intentions to actual behavior. That may have been valid in some contexts, okay? So your intention to go and eat dinner at a restaurant May, be, may impact significantly uh, your actual going to eat dinner at a restaurant, right? But when it comes to our field, we have a challenge on that. And this is where I'm going to uh, discuss this here. So here is an example. And, and, and it moved to a point where we have publications recent. Here is a publication in a, in a valid journal from a, a, a reputable publisher. Yet the content, once you start reading it, doesn't make sense. Okay, well, let's talk about that. And so, so the the paper here is is obviously trying to talk about risk and uh, and crisis and whatever. And they develop this whole model that their dependent variable is basically or one of the key variables, usually intention to what I call intention to X, is the dependent variable of those research studies, right? And so what happened was they they converted this measure, right? Uh, and and uh, in the context of intention to behave, in the context of uh, intention to comply, okay? And intention to misuse or areas like that. So here are three questions that they measure the construct of what do we call, and by the way, those of you are master students, so the constructs, when we talk about constructs, these are research, um, components that we create that there is no direct measure to it. So it's not like your temperature, right? I can measure your directly your temperature and I'll know your temperature. This is a direct measure, right? Or if I need to check uh, how many times you log into the system, I can go into the system log, right? And I can actually, I have a direct measure. I know exactly when you logged, how many times you logged. Right, I have this issue with my master students sometimes who never logged into the recordings of my session, never attend any of the live session, and they claim then that they have no clue about certain things and why did I grade them badly? Well, I, I have a proof. I have a direct measure that you never attended my session, you never logged into the recording, 
So that's a direct measure, right? But those theoretical constructs, what we call, are not direct measures, okay? Think about your satisfaction from the COVID-19 situation, right? It's an abstract thing, right? I can create an instrument, a survey with multiple questions asking you how your satisfaction with the situation or how your satisfaction with the way that your local, state, or federal government is handling the COVID situation, right? Here is an, an, an uh, example. Same thing, we can create an, a, a construct that refers to certain things in cybersecurity or in your information systems as well, right? These constructs are basically measured by multiple questions. Then there are statistical ways for us to actually see how cohesive these set of questions are. We use, you know, factor analysis and some other uh, advanced uh, st multivariate statistical methods uh, to actually uh, assess the cohesiveness of those questions into a one single valid theoretical construct. And th this has been established. We have books on research methods that outline the whole methodologies of how to conduct that and the whole thing in the behavioral science, which is great. But then let's take a closer look because it may not be applicable in our field, right? So specifically, take a look at these three questions that were used in this study, right? I would follow the advice in the corporate message, right, to reduce the, my risk of a private information theft. I would pay closer attention to similar instructions to prevent information theft. Theft. I would take the steps necessary to protect myself uh, uh, to avoid private data theft. Right. Okay. So just to show you how invalid this measure is, I took the instrument, and this was done in the discussion board in in the risk management class that we have discussed. I took the, uh, the the same questions, and what I did is I converted them in the context of motor vehicle and getting a driver license, right? For someone who is, let's say, um, you know, a young teenager, and and based on these questions, can can we measure? Can we say that we can measure their intentions to comply with the motor vehicle handbook? How valid is that, right? So read the questions on the right, and you're going to see that this, this is completely invalid, right? So what I did is I just changed what we would do in research in order to customize the construct in a particular uh, field. We will just tweak the question a little bit in the, to the context of our particular research. And so all I did here is I changed the corporate message to the DMV handbook and all those risks, I converted them to a car accident, right? So read those and think about an, an eight, a 16, 17 year old answering a survey to the DMV on their intention to comply with the handbook. I would follow the advice in the DMV handbook to reduce my risk of a car accident, uh, blah, 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 right? How valid is that? Obviously, it's completely invalid, right? This this will not be a measure, completely invalid as a measure of their true, um, you know, behavior. So it may be their intention. Yeah, I intend to follow all of these, but reality on the roads, they pass through red lights, right? In Miami, we always say in Miami, right? Red lights are recommendations. They're not law <laughs> and uh, same thing for other things right so how valid is that so where does that lead us it leads us to if we really want to do a solid robust research on cybersecurity, we need to understand a little bit deeper and so there are a couple of ways to do that i'll talk about some of the experiments that we are conducting but I'll go into the extreme. The extreme is really to go into some of the physiological measures of how people actually behave while they are being uh, subjected to certain security, um, um, you know, uh, stimuli. Okay. And one of the things that we're looking at is, for example, 
you know, on the iPhone, for example, in Apple, when you mistype your password, it will zigzag. Um, that came from some fMRI research that was conducted on how individuals fall for the regular messages and the ability to wake up uh, when they re receive any, uh, you know, um, uh, any any uh, stimuli. Okay, I'll talk about that in a moment and the theory behind that. But um, one way of doing that is by zigzagging that uh, password field, right? It will wake you up, move you from what we call system one to system two, which I'm going to get into in a moment. And so part of what we see is a shift in the last, I'll say about five years, moving into research that is more on the physiological perspective in order to fully understand how our brain is working, how we actually behave under certain circumstances. And so you can go into the neurosecurity. This is uh, done by uh, a couple of friends of mine from Berkman Young University. Uh, they conduct fascinating work, uh, Tony and, and um, his team. Uh, and, and we have looked at some of the research. We do have uh, one um, uh, research that just uh, is, is under development. I'll talk about it when we get there. That is more touching on the physiological. The other ones are more on the um, awakening the user. And that brings me really to the research uh, uh, topics that I conduct under my uh, lab uh, and with some of my doctoral students. And you can go to the, if you go to the side lab, I can uh, type that in here. Uh, and if you're, let me just make sure I'm not making a mistake. So scilab.nova.edu, if you go there, you're gonna actually hit the website. You can read uh, more about what we do, but essentially it's human centric is this human factor. And we're trying to hit that in the context of this, this center of the three circles of the technology pillar, the HCI pillar and the uh, socio organizational uh, pillar. So kind of the organizational uh, uh, society, uh, government type of uh, areas. And uh, we're looking to obviously from the perspective of, of social engineering, uh, cyber uh, threat mitigation. So let's talk about what, what so we call human centric lens. So kind of uh, looking at a binocular and uh, into research. Those of you have been the doctoral level, you've read some literature on how to uh, look at the research, how to conduct literature, valid literature review, and things like that. So we talk about this binocular of how how do we uh, monocular? I'm sorry. Uh, how do we look into the research field straight from that particular lens? And from our perspective of of the research group that I'm leading is basically looking at this lens of the human centric. Uh, which is commonly known as the human factor. And so what's the heck is that? I'll talk about one one area that you understand, but but just to put it very quickly, think about the, uh, the instances where you've been um, getting a message on your phone, specifically on the phone, or some email in your email list, or you've done some search on Google and you got a list of search results, and you just clicked on the link and then you're like, oh shoot, what did I just do? Or you had your phone and there is a pop-up and saying some sort of a, a message regarding some security thing and you hit okay and then you're like, oh shoot, what did I just hit, hit okay on, right? So we call this the oh shoot syndrome or if you wanna be precise, the oh shit syndrome, right? Uh, but the bottom line is that there is a, a, a theory actually that talks about what exactly is happening in our head. And so uh, if you're interested, you're more than welcome to read these two uh, very exciting books. 
the one is the under uh, the under undoing project, and that one is by Dan Kahneman, which I'm going to talk about shortly. Who came up with the whole idea after years of experimentations with um, uh, uh, Amos Travitsky, from uh, who's a professor at, was a professor uh, in Stanford, and Dan Kahneman uh, uh, is a professor emeritus in uh, Princeton. Uh, he received the Nobel Prize. I'll talk about him shortly. But the whole concept of those duality in thinking in our brain is what he came about. He talked about some some heuristics and some problems in the way that people actually make decisions, uh, and that led him to how people make decisions in economics, and um, and that actually led him to get the Nobel Prize. But the foundational work that he did and the experimentations uh, over uh, three, four decades that he's conducted is really what the foundation for some of our research. So basically, um, Dan Kahneman is, is a psychologist. Um, he, uh, got, he researched a lot how people make judgments and uh, their decision making, okay? Uh, specifically, how they behave. Uh, for the Nobel Prize, he won on his the context of his theory in uh, in economics. Uh, but uh, the foundation of theory is very, you know, it has multi facets to it. Also, I'm not going to dive deeper into it about the heuristics and how human error and human bias. Some of human error we do uh, research on. I'll talk about it shortly, but. Uh, the fascinating theory that he talked about and he came up with the idea is that really our brain has two systems, if you will, right? So here is an experiment. Very quickly, I'll ask you, can you solve one of these? Quickly. Okay, which one did your brain move into very quickly? Obviously, two plus two, right? Why? Because uh, that's that's the way that your brain operates, right? Your brain operates on an autopilot process, right? Doing a 22 times 17 is not an autopilot. It's something that your brain needs to slow down, uh, think, okay, that's a complex question. Wait, let me take the 22, I'm gonna divide, so I'm going to divide it into 20 and 2, and I'm going to multiply 20 by 17. I'm going to multiply 2 by 17. I'm going to, you know, maybe do 2 times 17, add a 0 at the end. Whatever strategy your brain or you have been taught from early age will still take you a long time to your brain, right? Well, compared to a 2 plus 2. Why? Because it's easy. 2 plus 2 is something you've done thousands of times, right? Your brain is, is operating on an on a autopilot already. And so the theory that they came up with was based on observations of different experiments. As a matter of fact, some of their theories came up that they tried to help some of the um, Israeli uh, idea, the Israeli defense forces to make better decisions on different things. Okay, and so they've conducted in the 70s and 80s, Amos Travitsky and uh, later on, then Kahneman joined him to do many, many, many experiments with people observing how they make decisions in certain things. Okay, and what they came up with um, in uh, the early 80s, actually, they, they came up with the idea that people actually have some biases in decisions, some errors in decisions. But also, they emerge with this idea that there are two really systems in our brain. One that is very fast and one that is very slow. And then later on in the late 90s, beginning of the 2000s, when fMRI came about, there were studies that were conducted that actually confirmed the areas on the brain of this theory. And based on that, he actually received the Nobel Prize which is very fascinating. And so what the idea was is that 95 of, of the times your brain operates on system one, it's a very fast, it's very reactive. It is 
uh, not something that you even think of. You think after the fact. That's why uh, the whole idea of pressing on the OK and then, oh, shit, what did I just do? Uh, because your system one already did that. And then you realize your system two wakes you up and say, OK, wait, 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 wait. What, what just happened? Right. That's what's going on. So if we look into the and, and there are more explanations, I'm obviously I'm simplifying the theory and the theory is a little bit way more complex than I'm simplifying here. But um, for our purpose, for our projects, we actually follow some of the simplified version of the theory. And, and the idea is that you have your system one uh, that is basically like an intuition. Think about how many times before COVID-19, okay? How many times it happened that you were getting to work and you're like, oh, did I lock the door in my house, right? Or did I lock the cars? Or how did I get to my work? I don't remember even driving here, right? You've been driving all the way from home to work. Your brain was operating stopping in a red light, hopefully, uh, you know, doing certain things, uh, giving the right of way, whatever. You got to work, but you don't even realize the way. You don't remember how many stoplights or how many red lights you stopped, right? Uh, if it happened to you, go ahead and type in the chat area. I'm, I'm sure it happened to all of you, uh, if not most. How, how about other things like, um, you know, you don't remember where you left your keys, right? Or you don't remember where your phone is, right? Or whatever. That's why we have on the, right? Those of you, if you have the, the I, I watch, right? We have call my phone. Why? Because we never know where the phone is. We forget where we left it. Where, guess what? You did it on system one, right? So uh, another example of system one that is, autopilot and that really is getting you at that and that can benefit us is where we train people again and again and again and again right so that's why we would train people when they drive for example in order to get a driver license we would train people on practice and they will do more and more and more practice why because the practice the process of practice builds system one Right. So when when you drive, those of you drive, right, when you drive and God forbid some, I don't know, a cat or a dog or, or something jump into your road, you immediately press on the brakes and then you're like, oh, shoot, did I just press on the brake? Right. Why? Because your foot, your brain operated on system one that basically caused you to press on the brakes as a, an intuition, as a reflex. Right. Uh, not really something you were thinking about. Why? Because it came about after training your brain that in those situations you need to press on the brakes, right? Well, guess what? In cybersecurity, we are terrible in this. We actually train all the people to click on links all day long. We email people messages, internal organizations, email people and say, click here to download this. Click here to download that. Well, guess what? We're training people's brain to actually fall for a phishing attack, right? So we'll talk about that in a moment. And so number the system two is where your brain is more um, taking more time. It, it requires more analytical, um, you know, calculations or more effort. It requires more reasoning, more debate, internal debate. Think about some very complex decisions that you might need to do that you don't just jump to the decision you may debate you may create a, a, a cheat sheet and you will write the pros and the cons and you will think and maybe talk to people right that's that's where you're kind of engaging your system too right that's that's a, a more elaborated advanced way of thinking uh, there are plenty, if you put, uh, you know, system one, system two into Google, you're going to find plenty of things where, uh, you know, and visualizations of how it applies to different areas. 
um, and where is it valid, you can see already how this is super important in the context of stocks, stocks buying, financial investment, especially uh, on the fly financial investments, right? And some uh, organizational decisions by top executives. Why? Because it, unfortunately, majority of top executives make decisions on system one. So we spent some time to look into the theory and what's the guiding theory. And some of this stuff led us to learn more that in order to build system one, you really need to develop a skill. You need to have people who are competent and went through the development of the skill in order to learn uh, and, and train their brain to function uh, in, in the proper um, uh, options that we would like your brain to fun function when it comes to cybersecurity uh, in, in the context of, of, of the skill development. So we spent some time to learn about skills and there are certain abilities obviously that the individual must have there is certain knowledge that we need to have. Think about this in the context of driving a car, right? So there are certain abilities an individual may need in order to drive a car. If they cannot see or they cannot function, uh, they don't have the abilities, right? Uh, they either cannot do that, they're not gonna be competent in that, they're not gonna be skilled, or uh, they may have a technology that augment their lack of ability. That's a, a whole separate discussion, right? So think about the handicaps who may have some technologies helping them press the brakes for them, uh, right? They may drive on a joystick, just as an, as an example, right? So they will have the ability to press the brakes. It's not directly, but they will use technology to do that. And then we have the knowledge, right? So think about the motor vehicle handbook, right? The, the driving signs, driving rules, all those will be part of what we call the declarative uh, type of knowledge. And, and then there are certain things that you need to learn as an individual, as a procedural. These are procedures that are happening. So this is where we build up the knowledge in order to get in the point where it's uh, autonomous, where you you kind of operate on system one already. You have enough practice to build it up that you get to the system one uh, thinking and your brain operates in this particular context in there and that will essentially um, quantify the individual to be competent right so we've uh, I'll talk I'll shift now to talk about different uh, research projects that we have done and then I'll move into um, um, some professional associations and your the role of graduate students, particularly doctoral, but also master's students were interested. So uh, one of the projects that we're uh, very proud of, we've spent a lot of time into it. We got a mini grant from the NSU uh, President's um, um, Award um, that sponsored some of the development uh, at the time. Uh, we developed an application. We worked with the FBI and the Secret Services and some and the InfraGuard group to look at the top threats that they have. This started in about 2012 or so. I've I had some discussions. Then in 2013, I received a mini grant, and then in 2014, uh, uh, I think Melissa joined in, who actually helped me to take take this into a, a, another level. And essentially what happens is we looked into development and we conducted the research with, uh, I think about 180 uh, participants. We developed a tool, an application, okay? This is where the applied research comes in. Majority of the research that I'm conducting, as a matter of fact, in the last uh, decade, it's mainly applied. Um, is an iPad application that helps us to measure um, cybersecurity skills from those threats identified by the FBI and the Secret Services and some other groups, professionals in cybersecurity professionals. We developed these scenarios that based on these scenarios, people were performing in the app their actions, their decision, and based on that, we measure that. And you can read more uh, the dissertation. Another dissertation 
we've done is one of the areas is the idea of how do you create a, a threshold of where competency is, right? So think about your driver license, right? So there is a knowledge, there is the ability, there is the experience that we build up in the individual to gain all the skill of driving, right? At what point we say, okay, you're competent enough. Here is a driver license you can drive. Well, do you want to tell me that every 16-year-old in Florida who gets their uh, driver license after, uh, what is that, 15 driving lessons and passing the knowledge test are actually competent? Well, they have the minimum level of competency that we would like to have, but it doesn't mean that they can now run and drive on 95 uh, to av and avoid accidents, right? Uh, so, so the question is, where is this margin of 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 um, level of threshold of saying, okay, above here, I'm willing to give you a driver license? And the context of that was done by uh, Rick Nielsen, who is a DoD guy and worked um, to on his doctoral research with me to try to identify where is that balance, where is that line of this uh, threshold. A research uh, dissertation that we just finished um, is on uh, detecting business email compromise. So uh, those of you who don't know, business email compromise is a significant. Actually, most of you in this uh, attending here should know, right? Uh, but if you don't, business email compromise is, is a massive, massive uh, problem. Uh, the FBI identified that as a uh, multi-billion dollar scam that is happening. As a matter of fact, right now with the COVID-19 issues, we're seeing a massive increase of uh, business email compromise through multiple areas. And the idea of, of this study was to try to conduct some mini experiments following some of the experiments that Amos Kravitsky and, and, um, and uh, Kahneman, Dan Kahneman conducted on actually measuring the decisions that individuals make uh, and, and the actual measurement of business email compromise and their ability to detect those. Uh, another study that we had is Will Perez um, uh, conducted a, a research with me on a group of uh, his employees. He's director of IT security for Royal Caribbean. And we looked specifically on two constructs. So here we developed actual application to measure and quantify and we do that, you will see this is part of the of the common denominator among some of those research projects to be able to actually measure and quantify those constructs. In this case, we were measuring cyber situational awareness on one end and cyber curiosity on the other end. And we developed as these video scenarios. So we would give them the videos and then measure their abilities to look in, during the video and click on things so more of their situational awareness and then also curiosity was measured during kind of a storytelling type of a thing if they click or they perform and that uh, produced this taxonomy uh, which is very valuable uh, to organizations right another research study we conducted uh, Take uh, looks at the cognitive load and password strength. And one of the issues we learn is basically, you know, nowadays every uh, every organization is asking all these wild characters and and different uh, text, uh, uppercase, lowercase, etc. Uh, and minimum of certain characters. You know, I have one. Uh, my InfraGuard system requires me to do like 16 character long and I can, I need to change it every, uh, you know, every couple of, uh, every 30 days. And so all of these up, uppercase, lowercase characters, all these are making it very complex. So we wanted to know in an experimental settings, if we increase the requirements on, on the user, uh, to what extent, we're gonna put where where is the peak point where increasing requirements in password entropy, we call it password strength, become counterintuitive to the organization, right? And so uh, Stefan actually measured 
uh, we took three groups. You can see here the three groups, and you can read those dissertations. Uh, three uh, where we looked at the levels of authentication strength. One, we started high, we went down, and then up again. Uh, that's the red line. One, we started very low, we went up and then down. And another one that was our control group. And we, you can see on the right side how there are number of failed logged in attempts, right? And we also measured the number of uh, the time, how productive they are for the organization. We basically found out that about 10 characters, if you move, move it more than 10 characters, that becomes completely in, uh, inefficient and non-productive to the organization. Uh, Tommy, who may be on the chat today attending, uh, is doing an experiment with me to look into human error. So human error, <coughs> we have a couple of human error uh, projects that we're, we're doing because human error in cybersecurity is massive, right? And so we tried to do this uh, a couple of experiments to see uh, where individuals fall more into uh, phishing or where they fall more into uh, potentially malicious uh, search engine results. Uh, so these are the two the two uh, matrices that you taxonomies that you see in front of you. We're looking at the two social engineering attacks. One is phishing. One is through a, a, a compromised uh, search en engine results on your browser. And then we uh, try to even dive deeper into identifying the environment, splitting the environment into destructive and non-destructive, and then looking at the device, looking at a, co a computer screen, larger screen, and smaller screen. And uh, we can already tell you that smaller screens people fall, that we already know from literature that during smaller screens, um, there is evidence that people fall way faster into uh, social engineering attack than in larger screen. Why? Because they operate way more on system one when they're on smaller screen. Um, Gabriel is working with me. I don't know if he's on the line as well. Uh, to look into a, a huge database. We actually got the Price Waterhouse Cooper database of um, um, all the major data breaches in the US from uh, um, the last, I think, 12 years. And we're trying to look into some of the top data breaches and try to dive deeper and, and understand from the media reports and some other LexisNexis reports in some government reports on those specific data breaches, uh, identified the type of human error that occurred. Okay, it's very difficult, uh, but we're we're doing some very interesting research. And then Molly, I think Molly is here um, attending that, and we gave a couple of presentations already on her talk to uh, the NSA and DHS CAE community as well, and. Um, her work is uh, very much aligned the system one, system two theory, and the idea of uh, we borrow from the car industry, the automotive industry, the um, heads up display that we have for pilots, um, uh, all the audio, visual, and haptic, you know, things that are moving, shaping. And think about when you get into the car and you don't put a seat belt, what happens? Well, you have a red light blinking at you. You have a buzzer ding, 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 ding until you put it. And it will bug the hell out of you until you actually put the seatbelt. Why? Because the whole audiovisual thing is to try to move you to become alert and to switch your brain from system one to system two. And so the idea of, Mo of what Molly is doing and we're, we're advancing very nicely. The study is ongoing right now. We, we, uh, she's collecting data right now. Um, we're looking at this audiovisual warnings and how to mitigate, using those to mitigate risk for phishing uh, attack. Uh, Amy, which I think she's also on the line, uh, is working with me to look on the concept that is called, uh, we call it pause for a cybersecurity cause. And so the whole philosophy came again. This is system one, system two. 
Why? Because when you pause, you're more likely to get into system uh, two. Um, so what we know is the idea that we took is really from the um, uh, you know the cross the pedestrian crosswalk timer uh, that you have blinking at you a number of uh, of uh, seconds that you ha still have time. Um, some other industries like uh, you see on the left here a nurse with uh, with a, a, a single use timer so they put that on the on the wrist when they need to measure let's say the pulse so they can click and uh, for 60 seconds and it will go down from 60 45 uh, 30 15 and then switch to red to tell them that they uh, the measurement of the pulse for that patient for example right uh, and, and also the whole aspect of the warning when you get the warning, how legible the warning is and how that affect your system one, system two. Uh, I'm gonna move faster here. This is my uh, our dog uh, who has uh, been uh, trained to teach online courses, specifically in cybersecurity for the last couple of years. I'm kidding, I'm kidding, relax. Uh, but the idea here uh, that uh, Javier, I don't know if he's on the call as well, but uh, he's working with me to look into the more difficult part of measuring uh, cybersecurity stimuli. And the idea of a dog here is really think about how do we train dogs, right? We use food, right? Or we give them so they, they know, for example, take a look at the, this uh, stress level versus trial or, or trials. Or uh, take a look at how many times you had to uh, put the food into the right place for the dog to know that this is the place where they eat, right? Or if you want them to do certain things, how do you train them? Well, uh, there is a habituation process, right? You go through multiple trials and that gets your brain to habituate, right? Basically, and that caused your brain to shift to system one, right? So habituation is the ultimate habituation is system one, basically. And so what we have here, is we are gonna, uh, this is still in an idea paper proposal stage. Uh, we're looking at using eye tracking movement of individuals. Um, and we're looking at um, uh, mouse cursor uh, with the ability to also shake the mouse, uh, do some haptic uh, uh, options and see how that impact individuals' um, different decisions, specifically in the context of of uh, trying to mitigate certain components of ransomware attack uh, for uh, for computer users. Um, I have three more projects. Uh, I don't know if uh, those individuals, I think Andrea is here, uh, but Keona Davis is working with me. She's about to finish. We collected some uh, data and these three projects are really in the context of uh, risk uh, mitigation. Uh, and measurements of different ways that we can actually measure risk. Uh, one of the things that um, uh, Emmanuel is working on, uh, and he's also collecting data now, trying to create these um, classification, threat classification communication standards. Um, uh, it may sound very complex, but I'm sure all of you know all the threat classification and communication standard and labels and pictograms that applies to any transportations of chemical devices, right? So any of you have been driving on the car on the road and seeing a car that takes, uh, you know, different chemicals, they would have this uh, this shape, right? Um, 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 uh, sign with different messages on it, different labels, different pictograms, right? Uh, those are what we call uh, threat classification and communication standards. And so we took the concept from uh, chemical uh, product transport and we are trying to apply that into safety data sheets for uh, specifically mobile devices. So when individuals buy new devices, they will get certain, uh, uh, you know, those uh, classifications trying to reduce the risk. Uh, Andrea is working with me on trying to identify users and classify them based on actual performance that they've done 
on searching different things and going to certain websites, certain domains. And so the data that he has is coming from actual routers, right? And, and those domain levels that those users are going to, and based on those, we're trying to classify those users into different uh, levels of and, and create a scoring uh, for the user in terms of um, of how risky they are to come to organization. Of course, I'm simplifying some of these research studies. Um, majority of these are way more complex than I'm simplifying. Okay, I don't know if uh, I should pause here maybe and ask any questions, if there are any questions on the research up to here before I move into professional associations. I'll be more than happy to uh, entertain any questions. I'm going to go ahead and open the mic. Please go ahead and mute yourself if you don't want to talk. Uh, if you do, why don't you go ahead and type in the uh, chat area first uh, Q, let's say, as, as a, an indication that you have a question. And then uh, you can use the mic. I uh, activated the mic now for all of you. You should be able to use your mic if you have a question. Anyone has a question? Go ahead and type Q first so I know, or raise your hand if you know how to. Right? Okay. I don't think we have anyone raise their hand. So. Okay, I see here. Uh, uh, Vasilka, hi, how are you? Okay, any tips for collecting data via survey? Um, well, you know, I have uh, a lot of tips. As a matter of fact, if uh, you want to check my website, uh, there are a couple of uh, videos, links from the video to video sessions that I did. Some of you are in my doctoral program, have uh, reviewed those. Um, and uh, to talk specifically on, on uh, data collections in the context of surveys. Uh, the problem with surveys in the context of information security and cybersecurity, again, come back to the original issues that I mentioned, is really the validity of what you're gonna be measuring. Okay, so take a look into those. Uh, Anthony, I think your, your, your microphone is on. Uh, but wait, let me just uh, uh, complete my answer to Vasilga. So uh, if you want to check my website, you're going to see a couple of videos on on, uh, on survey methodology uh, that we've conducted. We used to have the multivariate research methods course in the PhD. We're no longer offering that. But I have a couple of old videos that are posted to YouTube that... Um, I can share now. Now all of the videos are disappearing. Um, so um, okay, uh, who's next? Uh, John, how are you? Uh, have you read the Undoing Project? Yes, it's uh, it's fascinating and the impact. Yes, you want. Yeah, it's a good story. Me? Go ahead. Uh it was actually recommended by a friend, and it's it's kind of the backstory and the experiences of of Daniel Kahneman and and Tversky and um, a couple other folks. It's it's really it's fascinating to see you know surviving World War II in Germany and going to Israel, and it's just it's it's really good story. If you want a more right, so you know, so it's basically the story about their friendship more than anything yeah. else. But a lot of the, the book injects a lot of their research experiments, uh, which is really interesting. So yep. it, it talks about, you know, some of the motivation behind that. Sometimes you don't get the motivation as, as strong in a, a regular research article that you read, right? Yeah. Yep. Uh, and, and that book really gives you the context, if you will, yep. of the research. So, yes, very valid. Okay, uh, Enes, can you provide us with the recorded lectures? You mean for the survey, Enes? You're asking for the survey one? Oh, for this one, yes, I'll provide it later on once I'm, I need to convert it and upload it, of course, and all that. Okay, 
Uh, Taylor, what are the most challenging part of doing multi, oops, wait, uh, multivariate cybersecurity research? Well, I think it's like the same issue for any multivariate research that we do. The, the biggest challenge is to collect the data <laughs> and the validity of the data, right? Um, data collection is really one of the most challenging parts in any research that we are conducting. Uh, and those of you who are going to go down the route, uh, if you're in a PhD or a master's and want to do a, a research project, uh, just make sure that you follow IRB, right? And so consult with Dr. Wang if you're interested to ever publish uh, the work, but those of you are doctoral, you have to. But the point is, um, I think that um, the biggest challenge is really co collecting the data. So a lot of students think that the whole process of getting, uh, you know, the dissertation proposal or the research design phase and how to ensure that the research is solid uh, is the biggest challenge. I don't think so. I actually think that the those of you who are in data collection or those of you who are completed their PhD, you know very well how challenging data collection can be, okay? And so that, I would say, is the most challenging. I don't think the multivariate statistical methods are complex, you know? They are complex, but there are many books on those uh, to follow. There are many, many very valid you know, stages of research that we need. If the research was designed properly early on, if you have a dissertation chair, if this is guided by a, a dissertation chair, then uh, the validity is there. I'm, I'm sure the committee is, is ensuring. But if you're conducting your own research, make sure that you run it by some researchers who can give you feedback and say, yes, that's valid or no, that's completely invalid. Like I showed you early on, in the presentation when you t we talked about the intentions to comply with the information security policy in the organization, right? How valid is that? It's like intention to comply with, uh, you know, the, the driving laws when uh, then the people, their behavior is, the, the delta between their behavior and intention is like huge, right? <laughs> okay, um, Taylor, did I answer your question? Excellent. Uh, Clifford, about collecting data, what is the issue with Zoom in China collecting all the data directed to China, having uh, the only access key? Okay, well, you can read some of the information we shared that came out from the FBI. There are a couple of uh, reports. So, um, you know, it's not really, there are challenges with Zoom. Okay, let's start with that. Um, Zoom has some security flaws, okay? Uh, their authentication process was routed, uh, those who were on the West Coast, this is data from the FBI, those who were doing Zoom sessions on the West Coast of the US, there for a period of time, all their authenticated processes, uh, the tokens uh, to authenticate went to a third, site vendor that was located in China. So to conduct the connection was done in China. And basically what happened during later on during the session, we don't know. Um, so, or, or the FBI is not exposing that or uh, you know, providing all that. But what they're saying is that instead of coming and saying that, you know, Zoom is completely compromised, uh, we're using Zoom and NSU, um we they they sent out a set of recommendations on what they advocate people to do uh to mitigate some of the risks of the zoom challenges okay and so that's basically what it is uh those of you who have been in my isec 615 uh what do we always uh, start our classes with what's our fundamental rule of security that everything is anyone can type it anyone from my isec 615 or those of you who took my isec 615 
what do we say about all of our systems, all of our computers? Thank you, McLean. Everything is hackable, right? Everything is hackable. So let's come from that, you know, notion that everything is hackable. Let's start with that. Uh, how to measure actual compliance that's very challenging Anas. Okay, very challenging uh, absolutely intention is completely invalid okay there is a matter of fact there are a lot of research uh, a, a lot of journal editors who will come in and will tell you that any study that based on uh, that has the measure of intention anywhere in their measures is a, an immediate desk reject from the journal, okay? So, well, how do you measure com actual compliance? You need to have access to the data. Uh, for example, in this case, uh, um, you may want to talk to Andrea if he's interested, uh, but he will tell you uh, how actual data is collected in his case the data is traces from where people actually went uh, right so uh, obviously looking at the log files from the routers and looking at the domains if they went to domains let's say uh, uh, video games online video games domains uh, that's going to be documented it's an actual compliance or violation of the compliance, right? <laughs> so from the log files, from access to those measures is where you get. Other ways of actual compliance is if you if you look at some of the other studies, right? So in, in here, uh, some of the studies that we'll do is the ability, they're, they're clicking on a phishing, right? Do they click or they don't click? And, and the measurements of the actual clicking is the one. Uh, we have other, uh, again, some of these, I don't wanna, it's already, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit over time here, uh, but uh, the idea is that um, you wanna make sure that the measure uh, is, is valid. Uh, of course, Anas, uh, no company is going to give you access to their data. Uh, the point is that you need to facilitate uh, your ability to collect data. And if you don't have that access, then you need to change your research into something else that you do have access to collect the data. Otherwise, it's invalid, right? Um, so go and revisit that issue. Uh, Oscar, uh, how researcher uh, know the questions in the survey met the research goals? Well, that's something that you look into prior research first. You don't develop your own questions. You go and build your questions based on prior literature and you look at their validity. Uh, I just gave you an example in this presentation early on how I took this invalid set of questions for this research uh, construct of intention to comply with uh, you know information security policy and adopted it to uh, the context of motor vehicle and showed you how that is same thing invalid so this is pre pretty much the process that researchers will go to they will always base their work on literature you don't go in your like let me see where the wind is uh, blowing. Oh, yeah, that's how I like it. No, that's not how we work. And of course, we work with groups of, uh, Vasilka is, is right here, is, is look work with um, sub subject matter experts and, and, and running that to validate it. So you're going to see a lot of the dissertations that I chair have the first part will be to go through some expert panels Molly is doing it right now. She's collecting the data. And so even when we develop an application, like uh, you're going to see uh, almost all of these, uh, all of these uh, studies that we have done, we have conducted this research, collected some of the measures based on experts. If there was no measure before that is valid, and then went through a Delphi process, with experts, subject matter experts, to validate first our measures. 
Okay, in the case of Melissa, we had to, and, and some others, we had to even validate the actual scoring also in uh, scene. Uh, you will see that the actual scoring within the app, how to score certain activities, certain options that they choose was done by the experts. It's not something that they're, we, we came out with a, a framework that we think makes sense, but then we got an expert panel, we run through a Delphi, so try to get consensus of group of experts, and that basically led us to produce the validity. And again, we're following very traditional research methodologies that are well documented in, in literature, okay? Other questions on the research before I move into the professional associations? Anyone? No questions? Let me see yes, no in the chat area. Just so I know you're here, you did not disappear to the kitchen to eat dinner and left me by myself here. <laughs> Okay, excellent. Okay, so let's get going. I'm, I'm about to wrap it up. Basically, what I want to show you is um, that um, talk about professional association. So as, as graduate students, specifically the doctoral students, I highly recommend you to start to look at professional associations, but also look at what you're going to get out of it. Okay, and so start to look at the goals. What, what exactly are your goal? when you go to look at the professional association. And we're talking about a research, professional association that guides research, okay, in this context. Um, so what is the goal? The goal is to really, what we call to see the giants or hear them present or hear their own doctoral students present or research that they are collaborating on now. Um, and, and that's sometimes fascinating. You may have worked as a doctoral student on a literature review and you have this guy who's, I don't know, names Fresnel or names, uh, I don't know, uh, you know, Watkins or whatever the, the last name of that author is. And, you know, to meet them face to face, maybe your dissertation is or your research is built on top of their research. So to see them and maybe ask them a question can be fascinating, right? Uh, so seeing the giants or hearing the giants presenting, it may be a reason why you're going to join in a, a professional association. And it may be something that you need to a little bit investigate who this person is, where do they go, where, what associations they're involved with, right? Things like that. Uh, another item is to really gain skills. What type of skills do you want to gain? So a lot of our doctoral students, I, for example, invite some of my doctoral students to serve as their reviewers, right? Some of you in this list received the email from uh, my former doctoral student, Melissa Carlton, who is now a co-chair for the program uh, in one of the conferences that we are running in the knowledge management uh, conference. Um, and uh, you were invited to serve as a reviewer, right? Uh, so serving as a reviewer for conferences, serving as a reviewer for journal, uh, of course, getting to a level where you're going to be trusted to become a reviewer for a journal, maybe down the road, maybe. Uh, but right now, if you're interested to get into research, you may want to suggest yourself to be a research, a reviewer for conference proceedings. That's very common. As a you know, as experienced uh, editor, we sometimes what we do is we so by by our you know uh, research uh, law, some uh, databases like Scopus and uh, Web of Science and whatever will require us to have at least three reviewers for each uh, blind reviewers for each paper, um, and a whole process that we need to follow. Uh, in order to obey the quality peer review journal. And so what we would do is we may put, you know, three well-established researchers in that context, but we may put a fourth reviewer as a doctoral student that may be interesting to also 
uh, the doctoral student gain experience on how to conduct their review for peer review process, but also see what is out there, what is new. So when you're serving as a reviewer for conference proceedings, you basically see what's the latest research that is going on in the world, right? Uh, which is fascinating as well, especially if it's in the context of your area. That can be very interesting. So gaining the skills of becoming a reviewer if you want to be a researcher is something that is important. Uh, of course, uh, new research ideas, right? You're going to be going to, a, if, if you're part of a professional association, you may get a newsletter um, about some exciting research that was just published. You may get uh, uh, invited to attend a conference that they run uh, maybe yearly or uh, quarterly, it depends on the size. Um, and, and there you're going to gain more ideas for research, right? Uh, which will help you if you're, especially if you're a, a, a you know, a, 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 a just started as an assistant professor uh, or a, an instructor somewhere and you want to conduct your research beyond your doctoral dissertation uh, and you want to get some, you know, great ideas for current research that are meaningful and valid, those you want to probably get from attending academic conferences, right? And where are those academic conferences? They're running by professional associations, professional research associations, right? And of course, another thing is networking and have fun. I'll touch on that in a moment, okay? But the question is which association, okay? So in here, I would say you need to think about, do you want to go into a very large international associations like AIS, the Association of Information Systems, um, IEEE, ACM, uh, Decision Sciences, some of those very large international associations. The issue on those is, uh, on one hand, there are benefits there, okay? So they run doctoral consortium, they run activities specifically for doctoral students, uh, the problem is that, um, A, their memberships are very expensive. Attending their conferences are very, very expensive. And on the other hand, you get those other benefits that you may see the giants because they may attend so, those. They also have special inter interest groups. I was the president um, uh, for a while for the AIS uh, special interest group for the uh, SIGSEC, so the Special Group on Information Security and Privacy. Um, there are other special interest groups for AIS, IEEE, ACM. There are subgroups, uh, IEEE Computer Security. Uh, ACM has also their own uh, cybersecurity and computer security subgroups. You may join those, but again, the issue is money, okay? Because those large organizations they usually charge a lot, right? Or you want to look into a smaller association. So one of them is the uh, International Institute for Applied Knowledge Management. I'm serving as the president for the association for the last uh, four years. And um, we, it's, it's uh, although the focus is applied knowledge management, but also applied research in information systems, cybersecurity, um, and, and uh, related, closely related fields are being uh, part of our conference proceedings, our journal. There is a journal that we're running there as well. You can visit iiakm.org and, and learn more about that. Um, that's a smaller organization, 50, 60 people, uh, maybe 70 people. And the idea is way more neat, close, tight, and smaller group of researchers. I'll talk about that. So Tyler is asking, uh, totally worth it if you're doing IS research. It's a shame all the conferences have been canceled this year. I agree with you. Well, we for IIKM, for the Knowledge Management Conference, again, I use Knowledge Management, but the, it's applied, uh, you know, so the focus is Knowledge Management, Cybersecurity, Information Systems as a whole. We actually going to move the conference online, uh, and it will be run on Zoom uh, this coming June. So instead of being in Lisbon, we're going to be running it from home, right? Um, 
So uh, yes, a, uh, those uh, some of the IS uh, conferences can be really nice and really uh, good. Um, you know, the AIMSYS as well, and uh, ISIS, uh, and some other of the AIS, and IEEE, we have Southeast Con, uh, ACM is running their own conferences all over, but then the question is cost, okay? So if you're going to a three-day, and that's really the reason why we established IIAKM, the International Institute for Applied Knowledge Management, we were kind of sick and me and group of five other researchers uh, we're kind of sick and tired from these large uh, associations that charge you $795 to attend the conference, and then you get a two uh, um, two box lunches that has a cookie, a bag of pretzels, and uh, whatever, and a sandwich, right? Uh, and you paid $795, and they take... Uh, seven hundred and eighty dollars out of it uh so what we decided is to create this old-fashioned uh you know a com academic pure academic conference where everything that comes in the money that the people pay goes directly to cover all the expenses of the conference and that's basically what we do uh and so the quality of the food so you get lunches and you get dinners and you get uh, a lot of things. I will show you that in a moment. So do your ROI, your return on investment. As a matter of fact, I baked it into the presentation. What you're gonna see is here is a picture from our conference. Um, and what you're gonna see is that, th by the way, this is where I am over here. This is me. Um, and you will see that the Leaning Tower of uh, Pisa is right here. Uh, the cathedral in Baptistry is, is also behind us. Uh, the whole group of about uh, 50 people were on the top floor of one of the hotels overlooking uh, the uh, Pisa monuments. Okay, This is what the money from a true uh, academic type of a research uh, conference should bring to the participants all the people that you see are basically their researchers or uh their spouse uh and and uh, this is where i was talking about networking and having fun okay and eating well and drinking well and whatever okay uh that so that's uh basically what i have for you uh tonight i apologize that i'm about wow almost half an hour late uh beyond what i planned but uh if you have any questions by all means for the anything that we've discussed before on the research that we conduct or or the um uh, um you know uh uh the uh, those associations uh professional research associations by all means uh Professor Snyder, you want to talk? I think the microphones are on. So if you want to talk, go ahead. See you uh, typed in here. OK, no, no problem. It's my pleasure. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, close the recording. Unless you have any questions, I'll stay here for a few more minutes. If you have any questions, I'll be more than happy to entertain it. Uh, as Dr. Snyder said, yes, those were the days before social distancing, uh, but we'll get back to it. I'm, I can guarantee you we're going to get back to it. So it's just a matter of time. Uh, hang in there. Be safe. And uh, I uh, hope uh, to see everyone also in graduation eventually uh, when we conduct that. Okay? Beautiful. Take care, guys. Good night, everyone.